stuff. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a couple people that have asked questions. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start answering this. Now, some of these questions, what we have to remember is that this is a survey level course. All right. So there are some questions that you know you might want to know the answer to as a matter of curiosity, but it may not be necessary for the exam. Okay. So as far as the political system in United Germany, okay. Now, there are a few things that we need to know as far as, you know, Bismarck is starting off with Prussia. Now, first of all, German unification. Now, German nationalists in the early 19th century, they had a couple of proposals for German unification. One of these things being the Großdeutschland, Greater Germany or Big Germany. That was, uh, you know, that we include all German speaking peoples, okay, kind of a pan Germanism. Now, that was not what Bismarck wanted. Bismarck was more for the Klein Deutschland, the smaller Germany, okay? So the smaller Germany was set up so that Prussia would be dominant, okay? And so when Germany is unified, it's unified without Austria. Now it is set up under a Kaiser, but there also is a representative body, okay? So it's really, you could call this a constitutional monarchy, but really not a constitute, from the best of my understanding, not a constitutional monarchy like Britain necessarily. This is more of a constitutional monarchy with a very, um, you know, a very strong monarch, okay, the Kaiser, all right? So they've got, it's, it's, so look at it as a constitutional monarchy because it did have a representative body because remember, as far as you've got political parties, Bismarck uh, tried to take action against the Social Democratic Party. Now today, remember, Social Democratic parties are not, so to, so to speak, socialist parties, okay? They really, they, they want an expansive government, but they're not called calling for everything to be in the hands of the workers and the government and that sort of thing. You know, certain things, but not all things. Uh, you know, not taking the means of production completely out of private hands. But at that time, the Social Democratic Party, um, these, were, these were parties that were originally set up as, you know, Fabian socialism, as far as instead of Marxism, where the working class is going to rise up spontaneously in a violent uprising, let's bring about Marxist uh, goals, Mar the Marxist vision through the political process. Okay, so Bismarck did have to deal with some political wranglings and parties and that sort of thing. Now, also today, Germany is uh, is a federal state, okay, meaning that they have states just like the United States does, and the states have some degree of sovereignty within the German political system. Um, as far as in the German empire, I'm not exactly sure, but let me just, let me look into that real quick because now, now remember though, that is also something that we have to remember that it is, you know, not go, you're not going to have to have like much of a knowledge of what's going on here for the, uh, you know, for this. But if we look into, let's see, as far as the foreign policy law, um, constitution. Okay. So as far as that goes, the empire's two organs. Okay. So you've got a, uh, you know, a parliament there, universe. Okay. So as far as that goes, let me go ahead and just share this because it's got some kind of cool graphics here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. All right. Oh, Aisha, good to see you. Excellent, excellent. And I've still got to, I was just thinking about those AP World essays that I need to go through um, in the coming weeks and get those up there. But yes, uh, always a Aisha, whether it's uh, online or in person. Okay, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, so you've got, uh, you know, you've got two houses, all right? Uh, so you've got the Bundesrat, Bundesrat and the Reichstag, okay? Now, as far as that goes, for one house, there was universal male suffrage, okay? But legislation had to pass both houses. So we've got a, you know, almost in the same kind of sense that we have the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, that, you know, you've got the Bund Bundesrat or whatever. I don't, my German is notoriously bad, okay? My Dutch is uh, is pretty good. My Dutch pronunciation is pretty good. Um, I can speak, uh, you know, hablo espanol un poquito. Um, so, you know, my English is okay, but, uh, you know, even my Russian can uh, can be 
okay sometimes. But as far as this goes, remember, it's a written test. My German's terrible. And so as far as this goes, you do have a bicameral legislature, but and then you've got constituent states. OK, so you do have a, you know, a bit of federalism here. OK, so you've got the federal council and then you can see the different uh, the different states that were part of this. Now, of course, when you're looking at the German Empire, Prussia dwarfs everything else. OK, so you've got some different states here. Uh, Bavaria is uh, is a pretty big state. Uh, of course, Alsace-Lorraine that the German Empire got from France uh, after the Franco-Prussian War. But very much you can see the Prussian dominance of this uh, of this arrangement here. Um, you know, oh, wow. Can we actually? Oh, that's kind of cool. You can click on here and you can go to the great man. I tell you, these things are getting more and more technological. So you're looking at a federal constitutional monarchy with a two house legislature and a very strong monarch. Uh, interesting question there. Glad to glad to answer that. All right. So can I describe France under the Second Empire? OK, so the Second French Empire uh, followed up by, uh, you know, you've got the, you know, the Bourbon Restoration with, you know, after Napoleon, which, of course, was followed by the 1830 Revolution, which set up another constitutional monarchy. And then that was followed. The revolutions of 1848 created very briefly the Second French Republic. OK, and of course, that had Louis Napoleon as its president. OK, and so Louis Napoleon, after a few years uh, was, you know, of being the president, Louis Napoleon then proclaimed himself emperor. Now, as far as uh, France under the Second French Empire, the internal workings of France under the Second French Empire, um, can't really vouch for that. I mean, you do have Napoleon as the emperor, but you know what? Let's take a quick uh, let's take a quick look while we're, uh, you know, while we're here. Uh, you know, that's, you know, we looked at Germany. It's like, why not inquire a little bit, right? Um, so as far as that, uh, as that goes, let me go ahead and uh, let's see, the structure of government. Let me share my screen with y'all again, and let's look at that. OK, and I've got my kind of standing set up. I keep keep reading these things about like sitting too much. Now they say standing too much is bad. I'm trying like a tree pose kind of, uh, you know, kind of yoga thing right now. So maybe I'm moving around and, uh, you know, maybe I'll survive through the exam. All right. So as far as that goes, when we look at the government here, OK, so, uh, you know, little changed from the, you know, still little changed from the first. OK, his own imperial role as the foundation of government was to guide people toward yada yada. So um, holding his power by universal male suffrage. So, of course, kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like Napoleon. Uh, as far as that goes, OK, we've got an anti-parliamentary. Um, French Constitution of 1852. Um, but OK, so as far as that, uh, OK, so the this really was a very weak legislature. So one thing you see here that a legislative body is uh, is elected, but they can't initiate legislation. The only thing that they can do is that they can uh, they can pass laws that have been proposed by the executive. OK, and so, you know, this is pretty Pretty much a joke. Uh, looks like Louis Napoleon has uh, pretty, you know, it says here for seven years, um, France had no democratic life. OK, now he did use plebiscites. Napoleon III did use plebiscites, uh, ju you know, just like uh, his, uh, you know, his relative, his predecessor, Napoleon had. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's uh, that's that's kind of interesting. So anyway, but again, the inner workings of these things are not going to weigh too heavily on the exam, but it is kind of uh, it is kind of cool. Now, um, as far as the Ottoman Turks, OK, now what we need to understand about the Ottoman Turks is in the 19th century, especially as we're getting into the late 19th century, uh, we're looking at. Uh, you know, we're looking at the sick man of Europe, OK, that uh, that the Ottoman Empire is constantly in retreat and their modernization efforts before World War One, I, I would not say were all of that, all that effective. Now, of course, it was after World War One that Turkey, you know, that Turkey, which was kind of the, you know, the leftover of the Ottoman Empire, but Turkey did some things to westernize, for example, that Turkey abandoned the 
Arabic uh, script and went with the Latin alphabet. So they made some moves to westernize. Now, that's also when they started calling Constantinople Istanbul, and they started sending packages back if they were labeled Constantinople. It wasn't like in 1453 that the Ottoman Turks instantly renamed it uh, Constanti you know, Constantinople Istanbul. So it was after World War I where, you know, Turkey starts, uh, you start trying to make some uh, you know, some moves toward westernization, but I, but I wouldn't say necessarily that they were highly successful at this uh, beforehand or in the late 19th century, because they're really just their territory continually dwindles. Now, it would probably not be a bad idea to talk a little bit about the Crimean War. Now, this is something when you come to these fiveable sessions, um, you've got some things that aren't quite, you know, that I share here that aren't quite ready for YouTube, but, you know, I've got some Thing that at least we can kind of informally go into. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, and open this up and share it with you. It's going to take just a second here. All right, and one of these days you'll see this on YouTube, but I just don't have this uh, don't have this set up quite yet. Not quite at the point where I would uh, feel comfortable putting this uh, putting this on my YouTube channel, but at some point we'll get there. All right, so the screen is about to share. Wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. All right, excellent. All right, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, the Crimean War. All right, so the Ottoman Empire at this time was known as the sick man of Europe, okay? So this is what we have to remember here. The Ottoman Empire is in retreat, and the Russians want to take advantage of this. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is today the Russians have an interest in Crimea, and of course, right now, I uh, still occupy that, uh, that part of what is still internationally recognized as Ukraine, but Russia is currently occupying that area, which is predominantly Russian speaking, but they did not do that uh, in accord with international law. Now, once again, this is kind of in a similar vein because Russia's got its eye on Crimea and they want to, uh, you know, they want to expand their territory. Now, then we think about the balance of power that Britain and France are thinking like, no, 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 not so much here. Okay. And so Russia um, versus France and uh, gosh, this one is old because I need to put, I uh, should have put Britain uh, there, but uh, you know, there is no England per se, unless you're playing soccer at this point. Um, so as far as that, Russia loses this war and uh, forces modernization on both sides. And I'm still working on that. Um, Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade, which I was surprised that a lot of my students last semester had never heard this poem. Uh, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death road the 600. Now, this is, of course, uh, describing during the Crimean War, uh, really this, uh, you know, the second industrial revolution is just kicking in here. And you're seeing this uh, clash of old and new military technologies. This is really close to the American Civil War. It's, uh, you know, about halfway between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. And so when we look at, uh, you know, this battle where the light brigade charge, you see all of these diff all of these cannonballs. Of course, these are still old fashioned cannonballs, but they pack a punch. And uh, the British uh, just sent this uh, sent this light brigade in this brigade of light cavalry at this heavily fortified position. And when we look at uh, the entire poem here, which is one of my favorite poems. Uh, you know, I should probably uh, read the whole thing, but uh, it wouldn't take that long, you know. So forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs when theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the 600. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabering the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Yeah, charging an army while all the world wondered. 
plunged in the battery smoke right through the line they broke cossack and russian reeled from the saber stroke shattered and sundered then they rode back but not not the 600 cannon to the right of them cannon to the left of them cannon behind them volleyed and thunder stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell all that was left of them left of 600 when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honor the charge they made honor the light brigade noble 600 so a very heroic death that these men uh, men died but it's almost like a crimean war equivalent of pickett's charge you know it's like they got there they fought but they could not hold the position and they had to turn around now although they fought valiantly you can see uh, you can see up here that not though the soldier knew someone had blundered okay so we were looking we're looking at inept commanders now remember technology is not just the inventions but also the system that you have in place and so during before the crimean war and during during the British still had a system where military commissions were sold. If you wanted a military commission as uh, you know a certain rank, you had to pay for it. And so what this did was it kept the aristocracy and the people with money in these high positions in the military. And so it wasn't a complete meritocracy. And so we see that that is going to be one of the biggest things that's going to change after the Crimean War. OK, so one of the things that we see here, this guy, Lord Cardigan, the commander of the Light Brigade, uh, this was uh, this guy was a complete idiot and inept and got his position because he had paid for it. And so, you know, as far as that goes, that's one of the modernizing things that they end the sale of commissions. If any of you have ever seen the movie Zulu, you can see like a, you know, the encounter between these two officers this one guy that is from an aristocratic family and another one you know he's from this old military family and then another one that is from you know a more uh, middle class kind of background and you know isn't from that uh, old military aristocracy so we see some changes there now yeah zulu is a great movie to watch it it include you know it basically you get into the aristocracy versus meritocracy uh you get into imperialism and also the second industrial revolution uh because you can see these technologies like where about a hundred british troops are defending against these 5,000 Zulu warriors 50 years before that would have been impossible but they've got these uh they've got these repeating rifles now uh the last veteran of the Crimean War it's kind of an interesting bit of information Timothy the Taurus died in 2004 at the age of 165 that's quite old all right so as far as that goes ladies and gentlemen we'll go on to uh to the next uh to the next question but I figured the Crimean War was at least worth mentioning in this context because we're getting into, uh, you know, the modernization of European militaries, which is going to be important later on. So as far as the causes and effects of Italian unification. Now, as far as the causes, I think that, you know, you would look at the same thing that you see with Germany. Uh, the rise of nationalism would be one of them. Another thing would be the resentment about foreign influence uh, in Italy, because at that time you had the Austrians in northern Italy. Uh, you had the Bourbons in southern Italy. And of course, you had the papacy in central Italy and the papacy was seen as you know kind of you know outside of the outside of the country and for a lot of these uh you know early adherents to italian unification uh that they were you know they were not big fans of the papacy and the papacy wasn't a big fan of them either in 1848 when the you know when these italian nationalists took over rome and proclaimed the roman republic then you know that was uh you know the pope appealed to foreign powers for help. And so I would say that uh, that really, if, you, if you're thinking about that, that you've got, uh, you know, you've got the, uh, you know, the nationalism, which is of course going around, uh, you've got the resentment about foreign influence. And of course we could kind of think about the Catholic church in those, uh, in those terms 
as well. Now, as far as the effects of Italian unification, I, I would say that they're not nearly as, uh, and I don't mean to offend anybody if any Italians are watching, right? Uh, but as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, what was in the movie, The Blind Side? Uh, yeah, I see something in the in the th in the chat there. But uh, you know, I would say that the the effects are not as far reaching as what you would see with German unification, where I mean, it's basically you know you're leading to two world wars, and of course with Germany the creation creation of the largest economy in Europe even today. Uh, so that would be kind of my short answer to, uh, to that. Now, what was the impact of Otto von Bismarck on German history? Now that is, uh, that's quite a quite a question. You know, that would be that would take answers that I'm probably not completely qualified to even give. Um, but for one thing, Bismarck was the primary architect of German unification. And so as the primary architect of German unification, uh, you know, Bismarck is taking it in this direction. Like remember that in 1848, the Frankfurt Parliament tried to unify Germany on the basis of liberalism. And you don't uh let's see, y'all y'all need something to open that with or anything? Oh, y'all are good okay all right just had a couple buddies just show up here i uh, wanted to watch this broadcast so y'all aren't all y'all aren't alone people uh that are watching this on the internet oh okay maybe i should take a look at that movie then okay so as far as uh, you mean like not the actual charge just the poem right i don't even know what that movie is to, to, to be quite honest with you but I, it sounds like i need to look into it uh but bismarck uh, you know, is the architect here that, you know, the Frankfurt Parliament, like, you know, let's unify on the basis of liberal nationalism. And Bismarck's like, not so much, you know, that the future of Prussia in Germany is going to be determined not by its liberalism, but by its power, Bismarck wrote. And so that was the whole blood and iron strategy and the whole idea that really German unification isn't just based on, uh, you know, isn't just based on uh, you know, nationalism, but also based on basically bringing the rest of these German states into really a Prussian nation that we'll call Germany just to just to do it, right? And so as far as that goes, uh, Bismarck, that would be one thing. It's the architect of German unification. Another thing that uh, that we would note is, of course, he was the architect of the alliance system, which, you know, a lot of times we, you know, this, this is where, you know, people get, uh, you know, they use history. Stay hydrated, kids. But they they use history in terms of like, oh, I've got this one thing. So since I've got this one thing, then, it, you know, it's like the alliance system calls World War One. It must be bad. Well, if that's the case, then why is the United States part of NATO? Why is there the European Union and all of this other stuff? You see that that alliances really aren't bad, like in, in a lot of cases. I mean, as long as they're advantageous to all of the countries in them, uh, which, of course, there are alliances that you could have those discussions about how advantageous they are. But if everybody's getting an advantage, it's a great thing. And it also is a preventative measure. Remember that Bismarck is not, uh, you know, is not forming alliances to make war. He's forming alliances to prevent war because it's the sort of thing that if you think that you start a fight with this person and these other th three people are going to get involved, you might be a little bit more cautious about excuse me, about starting a fight. Was it during this thing that I got hiccups last week? I don't know. I just, for some reason, I tend to get the hiccups when I'm doing these broadcasts. So that would be another thing that we that we could definitely attribute to Bismarck. Now, the other thing, I would say the third thing. So the architect of German unification, the architect of uh, the alliance system, and also the architect of the first welfare state, all right? So, which is something that, you know, is definitely a big part of, you know, the Western world today, that, you know, in whether you're in the United States, Germany, the UK, you lose your job, you're not going to just be cast out onto the street right then and there, uh, you know, taking care of people when they get old and injured and all that. So, when Bismarck introduced old age pensions, um, hey there, uh, Mariali, Mariali, you know, however to say that it's a written test, right? That I'd like to get your name right. Uh, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, the old age pensions, accident insurance and health insurance. At that time, no welfare state uh, existed in, you know, really anywhere. And so Bismarck now, of course, his motives for this, it's it's similar to when you think about when Parliament in the 1840s, they passed the 10-Hour Act and the Mines Act. 
and uh, repealed the corn laws. When they did this, they did this to kind of shut down the whole Chartist thing that, you know, the whole idea that, remember, Marx was like, oh, yeah, they're going to rise up. And it ends up that the working class and, and we see that, uh, you know, you can see that in politics today uh, when you look at the Trump coalition, for example, that the working class uh, tends to be fairly conservative in their thinking. And as long as they don't see themselves as uh, being, uh, you know, as long as they think, you know, we've got food on the table, got a roof over over our heads and we're taken care of if something happens to us. They don't really want socialism, okay? That's not something that appeals to working people. And so Bismarck understood that in, in creating the first welfare state, uh, you know, was did something to bring the working class kind of, you know, into the fold and to make the Social Democratic Party a little less attractive. Now, did that stop the Social Democratic Party from existing? Certainly not but made it a little less uh, less attractive to people. So that's what they call state socialism, that Bismarck was bringing about socialism, elements of socialism. We wouldn't call like the German Empire a socialist country, but bringing about elements of socialism from above so that we don't have the chaos of the implementation of socialism from below. All right, so going into uh, going into that now, uh, as far as the Austro-Prussian War, okay, so when we're thinking about the Austro-Prussian War, uh, that is, you, you really don't have to get too detailed into this, but one thing you want to understand is that at the Congress of Vienna, you've got Metternich, okay? Austria was the preeminent German power, okay? So Austria is really taking a leadership role. And when the German Confederation is created, you know, you've got Austria and Prussia that are part of it, but Austria really had the upper hand. Now, that's another thing about Bismarck, okay? So when we think about Bismarck, Emily, we also want to think about the, you know, I, I like this architect word for Bismarck. Think about that guy in the Matrix. Uh, you know, that could totally be Bismarck, you know, that guy, that architect guy. But as far as that goes, that he's also the architect of German industrialization because Bismarck was trying to navigate between the conservatives and the liberals and the nationalists and the socialists and that sort of thing. And so to appease the liberals, uh, even though he wasn't giving them as many like, you know, democratic and civil liberties uh, reforms as they wanted, he very much supported industrialization. And in supporting industrialization, that modernized the, the Prussian military. So, you know, you start to see railroads uh, built at a higher rate than what you're seeing in Austria. And so, you know, as far as Bismarck's creating this modern industrialized military state, whereas Austria was not as quick to get involved, you know, to implement the second industrial revolution. And by the time World War I comes about, Germany... <coughs> excuse me, Germany was the number one power, okay, like the number one industrial power. They had passed up Britain. Now, the United States had passed up both of them, America. Ooh, all right, but uh, but as far as that goes, Germany was the, what had the greatest amount of industry in Europe. So when we think about the Austro-Prussian War, otherwise known as the Seven Weeks War, what you really need to know about this is that Prussia went into this war because they wanted to they wanted to unite North Germany. All right. So this whole blood and iron strategy was to use warfare in order to in order to unite Germany. So what he did was he, he started this North German Confederation and then defeated Austria in the Austro-Prussian War and then brought in the, uh, you know, the, the more southward Catholic parts of Germany. Now, of course, Bismarck was not, uh, you know, a fan of uh, Catholics and neither were the German liberals because they saw the Catholic Church not too much different than what you see in U.S. history, that there was a lot of suspicion that the Catholic Church is trying to assert itself and control uh, the government and that sort of thing and bring religion into the government. So Bismarck, not a big fan of uh, Catholics, but brings in those uh, that Catholic part of southern Germany and then goes in to the Franco-Prussian War, okay? So that is the third war of German unification in this process of blood and iron. So the whole blood and iron thing, you've got, uh, you know, the Schleswig Wars, which 
I, I don't really know much about that than other than they happened, and you don't need to either. Um, the Austri Austro-Prussian War, which Prussia is, you know, defeating this uh, other dominant German state and exposing that uh, they haven't gotten on board with the Second Industrial Revolution like they should have. And then finally, the Franco-Prussian War that completes the, this process of German unification. Now, remember, Klein Deutschland, not Austria. All right. And then when we're looking at the, um, you know, as far as, let's see, we've got a few things here that, let me see what I've, what I've got here as far as uh, what we've got here. Um, overarching uh, topic. Okay, Drew, that's, uh, that's pretty overarching. That definitely is. Uh, wow, these are some of these quite, oh my Lord, my dog's up there barking. All right, so let's take a look here. What were the great reforms in Russia? Now, by great reforms, are we talking about... Um, Let's see. Are we talk? Are we talking about Alexander the Second? Yeah. So these are the reforms of Tsar Alexander the Second. Okay. So what they call the Great Reforms. Okay. So Alexander the Second was a major reforming Tsar. Okay. So really, um, you know, now and this is where essentially Alexander the Second as Tsar was trying to bring about liberalism from above. Now, not total liberalism, okay? But remember that the Russian Tsar, now we mentioned that uh, the German uh, Empire had a two-house legislature. It had a constitutional monarchy. Um, but, uh, you know, and even uh, France, and, you know, France and the Second French Empire had a, you know, a represented body, even though it's pretty much worthless, we can see. But Russia did not even have a representative body at this time. Russia was still functioning as an autocracy all the way through 1905. So, you know, at that time, Alexander II, you know, was in a similar kind of uh, mood as Peter the Great. Like, Alexander, you know, Russia just kind of gets in these, uh, you know, in these phases where it's like, you know what, um, you know, everybody else is kind of pulling ahead of us. And we're going to need to, uh, you know, we're going to need to do something about this, okay, that we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to play catch up. And so for one thing, Alexander II, uh, he got rid of serfdom, okay? So he said, we are going to get rid, you know, so he emancipated uh, Russia's serfs and then had some other reforms, okay? So he started to reorganize the judicial system, um, these things called Zemsvo, okay? Now, of course, it's in Cyrillic originally, but uh, Zemsvo, now I'll, uh, you know, that it's uh, Z-E-M-S-T-V-O. And so what, he, what he's got here, is that he's creating this system where they have, you know, local, uh, you know, local judges and stuff like that. He's taking away some of the privileges of the nobility. And also, um, as far as that goes, that he's uh, he's also building the transcontinental, like a transcontinental railroad, the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So he's trying very hard to modernize Russia. Uh, now, he also had plans to create a state Duma, a representative body. Now, this never quite happened, okay, because he was, um, let's see, um, yeah, Drew, that's uh, that's a good idea. I don't think documentaries are a bad thing. Netflix has one about, uh, about Hitler and the Nazis that I, I watched uh, not too long ago. They've got a whole season, and I, I thought that would be great for somebody preparing for the AP Euro exam. It's called Hitler's Circle of Evil. It was uh, it was it was interesting. I mean, if I were taking AP Euro, I would certainly watch some documentaries. Um, but these great reforms, so abolishing serfdom and trying to set up local governing councils, and also you know as far as the industrialization and building the transcontinental, you know, the transcontinental railroad, the Trans-Siberian Railroad there. I'm still in kind of U.S. history mode, right? Um, and so with that, um, we are also, uh, you know, dealing with, you know, hey, maybe we should set up some type of representative body. But the other thing is that Alexander II was assassinated, okay? And so what, what he's dealing with, I mean, these people who are eventually going to, uh, you know, take over Russia, like Lenin's brother was one of the people that was involved in one of these, uh, you know, these anarchist uh, societies that was trying to, uh, they were trying to assassinate him and they were actually trying very hard because 
he was liberalizing. And so since he was liberalizing, uh, you know, they could see that's not going to help the progress of a socialist revolution if the czar is a liberal, uh, if he's liberalizing and trying to make things better. And so he was uh, assassinated and succeeded by his son, Alexander III, who was pretty much a very conservative reactionary figure um, who saw that, hey, you know, it's like my dad tried to bring about all this stuff. He's trying to be nice and look what they did to him. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, then you've got Nicholas II. Now, Alexander III, one thing they say about him is that there were no wars while he was, uh, while he was Tsar. Uh, so as far as those great reforms, associate those with the reforms of Alexander II. Um, who was assassinated. So, you know, they kind of ground to a halt and the Russian uh, monarchy became a bit more reactionary. All right. So the social, how revolutionary was the socialist movement and why did it grow? OK, now, as far as that goes, remember when we say the socialist movement, OK, we want to remember that there are different types of socialism, OK, that there and even at that time there were. So the earliest socialists were utopian socialists. There are some similar people in the early 19th century um, in the United States where, you know, you've got the transcendentalist and other other groups uh, that these early socialists, it was really more like we're moving out into the countryside and we're starting these collective farms and we're going to all work together and build this little socialist community. Now, that's utopian socialism. Now, Karl Marx comes along with uh, with communism, which is a variant of socialism. OK, so communism is a variant of socialism. And it is, uh, you know, as, as far as Marx saw it, he saw this as, uh, you know, scientific. OK, so Marx comes along and this is where he brings about this kind of revolutionary element. Now, before Marx, you've got, uh, you know, before Marx is right, it publishes the Communist Manifesto. You've got Louis Blanc in France, who was really wanting, you know, as far as that form of socialism, he wanted national workshops for the unemployed, uh, not necessarily revolutionary socialism as much as to bring about socialism through the political process. But it's really Karl Marx who is saying that there's going to be the spontaneous uprising of the working class. And so communists now in the late 19th century, you've got communists and then you've got the anarchist. OK, which uh, this is an interesting uh, thing. You know, I was reading that, you know, in the late 19th century, I mean, it's not communists that shot uh, Alexander, or, you know, I forget who shot, bombed. What was that? What happened to him? what was happened to him, right? Uh, but as far as that goes, the people who assassinated Alexander II were not communists, they were anarchists. And they were basically committed to using acts of terrorism in order to bring about the um, end of these, uh, you know, of these great, uh, you know, great powers, the great states. Because anarchists, they believe that there should only be government at the local level, that there should be like these socialist, like local government at the local level. And whereas, you know, when you look at the development of communism, it's like we need to take over these big state apparatuses. And so, you know, eventually the, you know, Lenin's group, uh, you know, won, uh, won out, but there were different, mo you know, different modes of socialism. So the other thing though, we, that we need to remember is in the late 19th century. Now today, labor parties are basically center left parties. Like if you look at the labor party in Britain today, uh, you know, that is a center left party. Uh, they don't believe in, uh, you know, in eliminating private ownership. Uh, you know, they don't believe in seizing all of the means of production. So they've calmed down a lot, moved a lot toward the center. But when labor parties originally started, this was, uh, the strategy was, Fabian socialism. Now, this goes back to Fabius Maximus during the Punic Wars and, you know, where he decided I'm going to hold off on engaging Hannibal. We're going to avoid a decisive engagement uh, with Hannibal. And so what happens, the Fabian society, these are people that decided, you know what, we're not pushing for a revolution. Instead, we're going to try to elect people, uh, get people elected to office, and we're going to mobilize the working class as a political party. And we're going to bring about uh, the these, uh, you know, Marxist ends 
through unmarxist means through the democratic process and so with that uh you know the socialist movements understand that there are various movements here and they're not all equally revolutionary okay so when we're dealing with those early labor parties and social democratic parties uh that is evolutionary socialism they want to bring about things uh you know through the democratic process uh, so as far as that goes, that hopefully that answered your question there. All right. And let's see. Um, all right. Gosh, y'all are, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting into the, um, the dregs now uh, of the questions, but let's see what. OK, so let's go ahead. And um, Sarah, one thing that we want to remember is that Eastern Europe is always going to be behind with modernizing. And, you know, it's really difficult to call them modern in the same sense. So if we think about in the 1860s, that was when you saw Alexander II, which if you think about in a global context, OK, like, I mean, that's one thing I think that's good about studying. In European history and world history, like when we look at the American Civil War, and it's like, like, oh my goodness, these people, uh, you know, own slaves, and this was something that was pretty much a worldwide phenomenon at that time. That it was in the 1860s that Alexander II emancipated the serfs. So you see that this is, you know, in in the world in general, you're starting to see these movements uh, to, you know, whether it's serfs or whether it's slaves. Um, in the late 19th 18th century, you know, this is starting in the 1860s. And I think that Brazil uh, was the last country to get to abolish slavery in like the 1880s. OK, so as far as that goes, um, you're looking at Eastern Europe that was still really struggling to modernize comparing to Western Europe, but still trying. OK, so there are some efforts to industrialize, some efforts to modernize, some efforts to liberalize. Um, as far as that goes, okay? So as far as now, uh, Drew, in a few weeks, the Russian Revolution will be a uh, will be an emphasis area. Um, it's not one of, I will tell you, it's not one of my strong points. Definitely not one of my strong points. You know, and Emily, I'm gonna go ahead and let's take a look at, <clears throat> at this one here, um, the revolution of 1905, okay? Now, as far as when we're getting into need to know for the Russian Revolution of 1905, um, this is in the wake of the humiliating Russian defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, okay? So Russia has been defeated in the Russo-Japanese War. Now, that ended in September of 1905. Uh, you know, let me make sure. So when we look at the 1905 revolution, I'm about to share my screen here uh, because we might learn about this stuff together. And Emily, uh, you know, as a first year AP Euro teacher, um, you know, you're probably ahead of me on some a lot of things where, you know, when, when we, uh, you know, look at me, my first year teaching Euro. Oh, my goodness. But see, I've been doing this. Uh, I've been doing this for, uh, you know, quite a long, uh, you know, quite a long time. Uh, so, you know, as far as this goes, let's go ahead and take a look here. Now, this is actually, uh, well, wait, okay, so 1905 to 1907, that's, uh, the, okay, so interesting. This is actually, I mean, I need to look more into it. So thank you very much, uh, Emily, for always uh, challenging me a bit on these things, uh, because you're never really, as a, as a Euro teacher, especially if you're somebody like me who all of my coursework in college and in grad school, nearly all of it was in uh, U.S. history. And so I really didn't study a lot of modern European history as an undergraduate or a graduate student. So the 1905 revolution was in some ways, it looks like we did have an attempted revolution. OK, so you've got the uh, you've got this here. Um, now, OK, that's just generic revolutionaries, but you've got them with a, um, you know, with a red flag here. So, you know, there were people who were actually, uh, you know, and then, yeah, you've got uh, Trotsky um, here that's part of this. So there was an attempted revolution here. Um, but at the same time, what we can uh, what we can see here is that there was an imperial government victory. Um, so the 1905 revolution was not only spurred by, let's see, so wave of mass political social unrest. Um, it included worker strikes, peasant unrest, military mutinies. Now, 
this is the main thing, okay? The main thing that we want to take a, take from this is that we have the constitutional reform, okay? So the October uh, Manifesto, a document served as a precursor, which would be adopted next year. So this was now October Manifesto sounds like it would be um, the communists because the October Revolution. So remember, we need to separate the October Manifesto from the October Revolution. So the Russo-Japanese War uh, went through um, the 5th of September, 1905. So this is in the immediate aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War that Nicholas II is putting out the October Manifesto. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, we see here that, uh, all right, for, oh, um, wow, let's see. So a guy threatened to shoot, no, so, so um, yeah, so let's see, these ideas, Nicholas strenuously resisted these ideas, but gave in after his first choice to head a military dictatorship, threatened to shoot himself in the head if the czar did not accept Witt's um, suggestion. Okay, and who is this? Uh, did I miss something here? Um, okay, so Sergei uh, Witt as uh, a response to the Russian Revolution. Okay, so basically what we're looking at here is that there's going to be, okay, there's going to be an elected parliament um, without whose approval no laws were to be enacted in Russia in the future. So what's happening here is that uh, Nicholas II wasn't too crazy about this, but the end result of the 1905 revolution um, <clears throat> And I didn't realize is there there's an Arc de Triomphe in uh in Petersburg. I or a triumphal arch, I guess we would call it. I did not know that. So that's uh that's quite uh quite something. Now Bloody Sunday, I'm happy. So yeah, I didn't realize that they've got this uh this triumphal arch out there. Um so this was in the twenty second of January nineteen oh five. And as far as the number of people killed here, um, that you've got, uh, you know, over 143 deaths. Uh, wow, you've got over 6,000 arrested here, okay? So this was uh, basically a demonstration that was, uh, that was fired upon uh, in 1905, you know, not too different from the Decemberist revolt. Now, you can also see here that these workers are being led by priest okay so there are so there are some priests that are leading uh this thing you've got uh, father uh father gapone a, a priest and a popular working class uh leader all right and oh okay later on okay that's interesting uh and that's another thing we hear about like the um you know the russian like secret police like during the soviet era era but uh the czars had uh you know quite a secret police as well so after he was discovered to be a police informant uh then we've got you know he was murdered by members of the socialist revolutionary party so all kinds of interesting stuff here that i'm just starting to to uh, get into but yeah so you've got the formation of a state duma and the russian constitution of 1906 okay so this is basically going to be Russia between, you know, for about 12 years uh, between the 1905 revolution and the, uh, you know, and the 19, uh, the 1905 revolution and the, you know, the Bolshevik revolution of 1917. All right. So as far as uh, far as that goes, I think we've got at least a rudimentary answer to that question. Remember that Bloody Sunday was part uh, was part of that. All right, so we're finished uh, answering uh, that one, and let's see. Um, all right, um, let's see. So the causes and effects, uh, what were the good things? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, now one of the things, uh, Tejas, uh, that I've got uh, as far as the good things that occurred as a result of modernizing cities like Paris. Um, one of the things I'm going to be talking later this month about impressionism and art movements. And one of the things you see there is impressionism where there, you know, you've got uh, a lot of, uh, you know, visual depictions of this new, uh, of this new urban life. And of course you start to see like street cars and stuff by this time as well. Uh, in the late 19th century, they're starting to have like clean water uh, and stuff like that. They're starting to realize where disease comes from. Um, and so there are a lot of things that are done to improve sanitation and that sort of thing. Uh, this is, I will admit that this is not a particular area of, uh, of expertise for me. All right. So as far as that goes uh, now, Emily, I would say as far as the effects 
of German unification. Now, I think the causes would be very, uh, you know, very similar. Like one, you would say, you know, nationalism and the rise of nationalism. And also, I think that when you look at Bismarck and Prussia, like, as, as, you know, especially how, you know, the Prussians are, you know, like we're going to be dominant. OK, so, you know, this Prussian quest for dominance, I think, is important there. Now, the effect of German unification. All right. The effect here is going to be uh, that you have the, you know, the creation of really a super state. I mean, this is going to be the biggest threat to the balance of power in Europe at the, you know, in the early 20th century. And so, I mean, I don't think it's any accident. We see, you know, World War One and World War Two. I mean, Germany showed, I mean, sure, they lost both of those wars, but uh, my goodness, I mean, they've got, they're fighting against multiple, they're basically fighting everybody at once. Um, and so they're able to do it. And so you can see here that that is the effect of German unification is really the creation of this super state that offsets the balance of power. And, uh, you know, I mean, in World War One, I, I mean, Germany, they never really even invaded Germany. I mean, you had Britain, France, the United States, like in, in Russia. Um, you know, of course, Russia has their own problems during that. But at the same time, you think that Britain, France, the United States can't even make it into Germany before the armistice? I mean, that is, uh, you know, they have got quite a, uh, you know, a military apparatus set up there. So I would say there you go with the uh, with the effects there. Now, um, as far as that goes um, now, Russia, I don't know necessarily what's uh, going on, you know, with industrialization, of course, Alexander II, you know, in building the, uh, you know, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, there are certainly efforts in industrialization. It's happening, uh, you know, as far as the extent of industrialization, you know, we can get kind of deep into the, uh, you know, into the weeds uh, with that. But I would say not to the extent that it's progressing, certainly in Western Europe, but it is progressing. I mean, Russia did, you know, was building some industries there, but I don't think that that's really going to be fully realized until Stalin comes around with his, you know, five-year plans, like very much focused on industrialization. Um, all right. Uh, the use of space maximized in Britain. Not sure what, uh, you know, how to answer that. All right. So how did nationalism evolve? OK, now, one thing that we want to note when we look at the Italian and German unifications. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, so as far as uh, as far as that uh, that goes. Yeah, Emily, I, I'm like one of those people. The closer we get into the 20th century now, now there's some stuff I'm smarter than the average bear. But, you know, some of these things. Yeah. Once you get past like, you know, 1848 or so, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle on some things. So I can certainly identify. Um, but how did nationalism evolve? OK, so first of all, the early nationalists or like liberal nationalists, romantic nationalists. Um, so, for example, Mazzini, the father of Italian unification, uh, you know, he wants to unite Italy in on this romantic kind of thing, you know, that we are, you know, all like one country and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the revolutions of 1848 kind of alters that to where it becomes more pragmatic. So enter Cavour, um, you know, who is really starting to make these different alliances. And really for Cavour and for Bismarck, um, the, the, the unifications, it's almost like nationalism is kind of hijacked, okay? Because Bismarck's not concerned about nationalism. Bismarck's concerned about a powerful Prussia, a powerful German state that's led by Prussia. And then meanwhile, Cavour, you know, it's like, hey, we want to unite Italy, but we want to be able to build a power. So nationalism evolves into something that's more pragmatic, I, I believe, you know, in the late 19th century, especially with the failures of the revolutions of 1848. And they realized that this like romantic nationalism, liberal nationalism, uh, it really gives way to a much more pragmatic nationalism. So with that, uh, you know, we've got uh, that going on. Now, what political trends? Um, I would say here, as far as the political trends, uh, I think that the unifications of Italy and Germany are very important here. And then also that, uh, you know, of course, you've got the, you know, some attempts to liberalize Russia a little bit. 
Uh, in France, uh, of course, you've got for a lot of this time the Second French Empire. Um, so you don't really see necessarily like the forward march of liberalism everywhere. OK, but you do have uh, now, of course, uh, I don't know if I'd call this necessarily liberalism, but democracy um, in Britain at this time. This is where the British, uh, they go for, you know, finally, I believe, what is it, the 1870s, the uh, the great, uh, great reform, um, great reform bill of 18, uh, let's see. Okay, the Reform Act of 1867, okay? So this is where, like, really the British, they had resisted democracy. And remember, don't confound liberalism and democracy, okay? Because the thing is that oftentimes you let everybody vote and you let the unpropertied people vote. They don't care about property, okay? So remember that conservatives and liberals, they are united in their idea that we should have private property. Private property is a good thing. And so the worry is what it happens when you let the unproperty people vote. Uh, you know, you see that there's a poll that was released very recently um, that, uh, you know, you see these calls coming from uh, Ocasio-Cortez and some of her cohorts that, you know, we should have like a 70% tax on top earners. And the thing is, you look through every other country, you look at like the countries that uh, Bernie talks about and their, their tax rates don't exceed like 55%. Um, and so it, on the top earners. And so as far as that goes, that when people are putting these ideas out there now, recent polls say there's actually some support for this. Like when they're like, hey, what about a 70 percent tax on top earners? Um, and then, you know, you think about it like the Beatles in the 1960s. I mean, these weren't right wing zealots. You know, they realized that there's this 95 percent tax rate. And they were ticked off enough to write the song, Tax Man. Uh, there was one mem one of the new members of Congress that advocated, she said, hey, the tax rate from top earners has been 90% in the past, which for a brief time it was, but they realized it didn't work. You know, even European countries like the Netherlands has had a much, uh, you know, a tax rate above 60% it's gone down on the top earners to around 50%. So my point here, kind of bringing in some current events here, is that when you poll Americans right now, a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, taxing the rich at 70% uh, on top, you know, on their top earnings sounds like a great idea, but it doesn't really make a one. It doesn't really make a lot of economic sense. Now, I'm not saying that the wealthiest earners shouldn't pay more taxes than they're paying now. I think that there's certainly a, there are certainly a lot of credible arguments for that. But even when Bernie Sanders was running for president, I think he was advocating a 55 percent top tax bracket. But as far as that goes, people keep trying to one up it. OK, like, OK, now I want to go to 70. Oh, I want to get on TV. I'm going to say 90. And people start saying, oh, yeah, let's do that. But that's not in really accordance with liberalism, which believes that, you know, which states that people should be able to keep what they earn, you know, a reasonable portion of what they earn, uh, no matter how much that is. So understand that in the, you know, in the 19th century, there were a lot of liberals that are thinking, we don't want people who don't own property voting because no telling what they're going to do. Um, and of course, uh, you know, so in 1867, they passed the Reform Bill of 1867, which basically, uh, you know, creates uh, an enfranchise. Now, this enfranchise part of the urban male working class. Okay, so they didn't do it all at once. It was still, uh, you know, an incremental thing, but it, you know, 1867 was the first time that, uh, you know, that working class people, uh, you know, people voted. And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, we start to see this unprecedented expansion of, uh, of suffrage. And so in Britain, you, you definitely see that it's, uh, you know, it's moving toward that universal, uh, that universal suffrage. So as far as that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, that's uh, what we've got tonight. Now, remember to go to fiveable.me and check out the, uh, you know, the Fiveable Plus membership. If you don't have one already, it's certainly worth investing in now. It's at a great price. It'll be higher later and it allows you to look at archives and also we'll get you into the cram sessions that we're doing closer to the exam. Uh, next week's topic, Fiveable will put that out. Now, the thing is, what you need to do is make sure you're subscribed to the Fiveable, uh, you know, mailing list and follow Think Fiveable 
on Twitter and Instagram. Okay. So, you know, as far as that goes, make sure that you're following Think Fiveable on Twitter and Instagram, and they'll be sending that stuff also to you via email. And we'll make sure that the topics get out there, but make sure that you are following them so that when they announce the topics that you'll see those come out. All right. And thank you, Drew. And thank you for everybody that showed up. And um, yeah, and Drew, as far as the DBQ, I have a lot of tips. Just type in on YouTube, AP Euro DBQ. I've got a video on that that's free. And I've also got a, uh, Emily, I'm trying to mark it here. Come on. Uh, but uh, but as far as far as that goes, uh, you know, we're trying to convert. Uh, we're trying to convert followers here. Uh, so as far as that goes, uh, make sure to take a look at my AP Euro DBQ video. Also, I've got my eight month writing clinic that goes even more in depth into that if you're interested in that. But, uh, check, you know, start off with the free video that's available on YouTube. Just search for AP Euro DBQ. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will see y'all next week. And it is always a pleasure. Yes, and you're welcome. And thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, Azella.